Guys, you know, I, don't, I know it was already mentioned, but so much work goes into these conferences, and I go to a lot of men's conferences around the country. This is not just one of the best run conferences I've ever seen, but the guys that put this conference on are just super genuine, and I think that we need to give a round of applause to everybody who's been involved in this. That's right. And it has been an honor to be with you guys here today. I'm so glad so many of you came and you took time out of a, a pretty decent Saturday from Michigan to show up and be here. And we do that not because we're weird, but because we love Jesus Christ. And, you know, the Catholic faith, it's such a joy to be able to talk about the Catholic faith. I, never, I gave you my conversion story. I never even wanted to become a Protestant pastor, even when I was Protestant. Never in a million years did I think that I was going to be some semblance of some kind of a Catholic evangelist. But I love talking about the Catholic faith, and a lot of you have come up to me and had wonderful things to say about your own experience in the church as well. And one of the things I think that's been hammered home today, I think for you guys, by Elvis and Father Thalen and Father Sirico and the guys from Kepha, is that the Catholic faith, while in one sense is this beautiful piece of art, it's something that's beautiful to, ex to experience and behold, on the other hand, it's a beautiful piece of art that needs to be practiced. We have to practice our Catholic faith. And that's why this conference exists. And so I want to close this out today by kind of firing us up and reminding us that at the end of the day, this is all there is. I was channel surfing again one day a few years ago, as is my want and yours as well. And I was flying through looking for the game and I stopped. Because the person who was being interviewed was Andy Griffith. Now, how many of you guys remember the Andy Griffith show? How many of you guys watched Andy in prime time? You guys are old, right? <laughs> but it was one of those ridiculous entertainment shows, you know, that focuses stupid amounts of attention on these celebrities who have really done nothing uh, with their lives. But I paused because it was Andy, and I knew enough about Andy uh, from watching him on my little black and white TV when I was homesick from school pre-cable days. You know, this guy was a Christian role model. He's a, a Christian man in Hollywood who wasn't afraid to talk about his faith. And I thought, you know what? As a role model, this is a guy who deserved all the attention that he could possibly get. And that's why what he said in this interview to this celebrity gossip entertainer just stopped me cold. Now, the occasion for the interview was his 80th birthday. And after listing all of his career achievements, all the things that he'd done, the interviewer said, Mr. Griffith, if there's one thing you could change about your life, what would it be? And without skipping a beat, Andy said, everything. Now realize, that's crazy. The reporter was just as stunned as I was because someone typically in his kind of position, they would say, like, well, look, all those different experiences that I had in my life have made me who I am. And who wouldn't want to be me? After all, I'm a Hollywood star, right? But here was a guy who had garnered money, fame, and respect from all quarters. And given the opportunity, he said, I would change everything. And echoing my own voice, the reporter said, well, why? And Andy said, as a Christian man in the twilight of my life, I know that there's a lot I left undone. I could have done more for Jesus Christ. And Andy's statement instantly challenged all of my priorities. And it filled me immediately with a, a fear of one day having regrets that I didn't do everything that I could for our Lord during my precious time on earth. And realize, it was like I was a bad guy. I have daily communicant at Mass, doing my best as a husband and father to provide for my wife and my kids. I was even teaching a Bible study at my local parish for crying out loud. Like, isn't that enough? No. As I've come to understand... It's not even close to enough. Now, I don't normally quote French poetry, but the poet Leon Blois nailed it when he says that life holds only one tragedy, ultimately not to have been a saint. Now, I want you to stop and think about that, guys, because as Catholics, we are so very familiar with the concept of sainthood. I think, though, 
that we forget that their lives, these are real people, right? Their lives involve so much more than those highlight reels we read about in those saint stories that are sitting on our bookshelves at home. And I love the saint stories, right? But they make every saint seem almost like they're superhuman. You ever notice that? Like they're the guys from the hilarious Dos Equis commercials. He was so holy, his guardian angel asked him for protection, you know? <laughs> Stay holy, my friends. Every woman in a saint book is the most beautiful woman who ever lived. And I'm not saying there aren't beautiful holy women. There are. I married one. She's not a saint yet. But I do provide ample opportunity for growth and sanctity for her. <laughs> and I'm not making fun of saints at all. We need to read their lives and we need to emulate them because they are prime examples for us. And in my own often pathetic way, I'm trying to be one of these guys. But I do think that we think of saints as kind of this different species from the rest of us. Like, they're aliens who just kind of happen to live among us. And they used to be normal guys, but then they got bitten by that radioactive holiness spider. Now they're clinging to the sides of church walls, just kind of looking down on the rest of us. <laughs> now, on the other hand, it's not altogether wrong to think that saints were different, that saints were superhuman. Why? Because they were natural guys who allowed supernatural grace from God to empower every aspect of their lives. Remember, these guys struggle with saints, excuse me, with temptation and vice just like we do. Except for Our Lady, saints are made. They're not born. How many of you have heard of St. Augustine? All right? Of course. Why? Because if you're going to give us the top five list of guys in Western civilization, Augustine is easily on that list. This is a guy who, saint, doctor, the church, who's Phenomenal theologian. He's quoted more times in the, Catholic, the Catechism of the Catholic Church than anybody else except the biblical authors. This is a guy who lived a notoriously sinful life in his early years. He was a teenage father at 17. He lived with his mistress for 17 more years after that. And this is a guy who even as he's feeling the tug of our Lord, he prayed. You know when he prayed? Grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. You think he can't identify with what it is that you and I experience in this life? Of course he can. And plunged into what he himself described as a whirlpool of shameful deeds that began early in his life. It was years before he realized the vanity and emptiness of his ways. I sought for you outside myself, he says in his famous book, The Confessions, but I did not find you the God of my heart. In fact, in Confessions, he says he is still overcome and attacked by temptations. They wash over him. And the only thing that gets him through is the grace of God. And this is the thing with the saints. See, they wanted to be holy more than anything else. That was the goal. That's why you read stories of St. Francis when his purity was being attacked. You know what he'd do? He'd go roll himself in the snow. When was the last time you did that? St. Benedict, not to be outdone, went and jumped in thorn bushes. You ever done that? Mother Teresa would have the entire world hanging on every word as she gave a speech at the, at the UN. Then she'd go back to her convent and she would clean toilets just so pride wouldn't take root. See, these people faced greater challenges, frankly, than you and I, I hope, ever will. When was the last time you, you went to an arena with lions or a gladiator or someone threatened to burn you at the stake? It might happen here, especially if we don't wake up, but it hasn't happened yet. But their lives are proof positive of St. Paul's admonition that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And while I can accept on one hand that saints are just like me, I have to chuckle at the ridiculous thought of my face Right, this mug on one of those laminated holy cards. <laughs> right? But isn't that the goal? Right? Not to become a bookmark, but to become a saint. <laughs> Other people have done it. You and I are supposed to do it too. Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5:48, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's a pretty shocking statement when you get down to it. Jesus is kind of setting the bar high, isn't he? Perfect. Haven't you seen who I'm de descended from, Lord Jesus? Haven't you heard of these people named Adam and Eve? I'm pretty sure he knows the story. This is why he had to come and do this. But when you think it's too hard 
Just remember that Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew that with God, all things are possible. In fact, it's not going to happen without God. But the entire point of Jesus Christ's passion, death, and resurrection was for you and I to become perfect, to join the family of God, the communion of angels and saints worshiping around the throne of Almighty God. Now, total perfection is not going to happen until we are finally and fully unified with Almighty God in heaven. But you've got to realize something, guys. Eternity is not something that begins after you die. You don't live two lives. One now and one later. You got one life to live. Everybody in here has an immortal soul with an eternal destiny. Started with your baptism. You know what that did? It poured supernatural grace into your soul. And don't ever underestimate the power of that grace. It is beyond the value of anything you can possibly imagine. Every time we sin, we turn away from grace. What a loss that is. But baptism gives you grace. But we have to progress in the spiritual life. You heard Elvis mention the word purgation, right? The purgative way. These are one of the three stages of the spiritual life. That those of you who have prayer works, you'll see I talk about it in there. The purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive ways. These are the stages of growth in the Catholic spiritual life. You better learn them. Because you're going to go through them one way or the other. You're supposed to mature as a man of God in the spiritual life just like you do in the natural life. We've got to grow up. Now that perfection and that movement toward divinity that God offers to us is something that can only happen by God's power. But you and I have a role to play. Our job is to get rid of anything and everything in our lives that would keep the supernatural grace from Almighty God from having its maximum impact upon our lives. That's goal number one. Get holy. Here's the kicker. It's not enough to grow personally. You and I have a responsibility for others. We have to move toward perfection. We are joined, right? We are brothers. You heard Deacon Thorndale talking about this earlier, and, and Mike and, and Greg and all these guys, right? We're talking about brotherhood. You can't do this on your own. We help each other toward perfection. This is how we fulfill the whole law. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, and we love our neighbor as what? As ourselves. Isn't that interesting? Because we love ourselves, don't we? When was the last time you were able to walk by a mirror and not check yourself out? How you doing, right? I used to go like this, but it doesn't matter anymore, right? But we love ourselves enough to buy the clothes that we think will look good on us or order the food at the restaurant that's going to satisfy us, not somebody else. Jesus knows this. And so he says, since you're always looking out for A number one, I want you to love other people as much as you love yourself. So we glorify him in our own lives and we lead other people to him as well. We're all a part of the same human family that God desires to make part of his divine family, which is what you were made for. Because that's what the church is at the end of the day. It's God's family. This truth struck me very deeply the night that I was brought into the Catholic faith. Easter Vigil 1998. Again, at Franciscan University, as I told you before. And after all the study and the prayer and the tears, and it, it really it came down to this moment. And again, my, my household that I grew up in was so very... Protestant, right? And so this move caused all kinds of upheaval. And I told you that my sister, my brother-in-law, my best friend and, and his fiance, they traveled from Chicago and Indianapolis. And they took off at the end of the, at the vigil, as I told you. Now, it probably didn't help that during the vigil liturgy, that sitting just a few rows in front of them was a buddy of mine I'd grown up with, the one who's now a priest from that Vogel family. And at the, at the time, he was a member of one of these begging Franciscan orders, right? And these guys are pretty nappy looking. And he, you know, they all try and grow a beard, and they wear basically the, the equivalent of a burlap sack cinched with a giant rope rosary, right? You know the kind of guys that I'm talking about. 
And I remember looking out of the crowd after I was confirmed, and it's a college campus, and everybody's going crazy, right? And I see my buddy Dave, brother Dave, and he's jumping up and down. And he's got a rosary as big as that around his waist, and it's like a, it's like a mace just wiping people out in a 15-foot radius. And everyone's like, wow, I had a charismatic experience, man. I felt the hand of God, right? Is there a red mark right here? I really felt his presence. You know, I, I tell people all the time, the hardest part about being Catholic isn't the theology. If you're really honest with yourself, with the grace of God, you can get there from here, right? The hardest part are the customs. The hardest part are the, the, the weird things that we do as Catholics. There's nothing in the experience of an evangelical that prepares them for someone who looks like a Jedi hippie, right? <laughs> we just didn't have those people. My son, Jack, who got introduced at the beginning of the day today, when he was four years old, we were in line for communion. When you have a four-year-old son, you know, they got ants in their pants and they're everywhere, and you're just hoping they don't, you know, take their clothes off on the way to receive communion, right? And so I'm trying to keep him in line, and we're walking. And as we're going down the line of communion, I look over, and to my right, I see one of Father Benedict Grissel's CFR priests. If you've ever seen these guys, they look like Shaolin warriors, right? And so Jack's into Star Wars, you know, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And so I, I'm walking, and I lean down into his ear, and I said, Jack, look, Jedi. He was like, oh. <laughs> even Jedi received Jesus. They better, right? But as painful as the spiritual estrangement that I felt between me and my brothers and, and, and sisters was, when it finally came time for me to receive our Lord, I couldn't wait. In fact, my local sponsor who was there, a guy named Michael Miller, who goes to Sacred Heart here in Grand Rapids, says, I literally elbowed him out of the way so I could be first, right? But can you blame me? I was about to encounter God in a radically new way. It was awesome. And as I floated back to my seat, and I'm kind of like squished in there with all these people, thanking God like for all the things he had done, kicking and screaming to, to drag me into the church, right? I was a tough nut to crack. And so I was so grateful. But then I looked up and I saw these people walking past me. And that's when it hit me. These people, most of whom I never met, had become a part of my family. Or I had become a part of their family through the sacraments. No one's going to replace mom and dad or my brothers and sisters. That's not what I mean. But I had been incorporated into the family of God in a new and deeper way through the sacraments. And suddenly, I didn't feel so quite alone. Because this is basically like the biggest family reunion that I've ever been a part of. Now, being part of the family comes with some responsibility. You know, we have kids and you send them off somewhere, you're like, hey, you know, look after Jack, you know, look after, look after Maisie or Susie. Well, the same thing with us. As I said, you and I have a responsibility to push ourselves and each other to heights of holiness. That's what it means to be a Catholic man. That's what it means to be a saint. And we've got to realize, guys, that the stakes of this life are far too high for us to not embrace a radical holiness, to not really seek after Jesus Christ. St. John Paul II said that today we have the greatest need of saints whom we must assiduously beg God to raise up. Why? Because saints are game changers. And let's be honest, the game is in need of change because everybody is so busy with this that and the other and we're consumed with the created things instead of the creator look i'm just as guilty of this as anybody else god made a pretty cool world down here for us even he said it was very cool back in genesis right it's a great world that god gave us the problem is that the pleasures of this world all too often have our full attention and there's no room left for god the fact is we have to start seeing the world differently. We got to recognize the true reality, the spiritual dimension of what's going on even right now. Remember the movie trilogy, The Matrix, back in the 90s? And then that one scene in the beginning where Neo meets Morpheus. And Morpheus offers him the choice between two pills. You can take the blue pill which will lead you back into a bland, meaningless life that's full of all kinds of distraction but will never satisfy you. Or you can take the red pill, which will show you the reality behind the curtain. Instead of a pill, Jesus offers us the Eucharist, 
right? The medicine of immortality that pierces the darkness of this world and gives us a kind of a second sight. It's like 3D spiritual glasses that make the reality of this world pop with a greater clarity and in depth because it shows us what this world is really ordered to. See, it's not that this world isn't real. This world is more real than you and I realize. And there is a mystery that we are missing and we, if we just stay at this two-dimensional surface level. level. So we have to put on our glory glasses so that we can see that the splendor and the beauty of this world, as great as it is, is just a hint of what it is to come. And what's going to come is going to blow your mind. It's available to each and every one of us who want to lift our eyes to heaven. That's what we have to do. But we're looking everywhere but up. This is the difficult situation that Christianity finds itself in. Because the people, the people, the things of God just aren't at the, at the top of people's lists. Our passions lie elsewhere. I say Notre Dame, we think football. And not Our Lady. It's crazy. And the question I keep asking myself is, how in the world did this happen? How do we get here? How do we lose the ability to get people to turn and take notice and follow us? We're talking about an institution, the Catholic Church, which boasts more than a billion people worldwide. And we have lost our place as the primary influencer on the rest of culture. The majority of the world is being led on a path of spiritual destruction by the spiritually dead. And they're not giving us a second glance. Those people have never experienced the grace and the truth and beauty of Jesus Christ. And they're the ones who are setting the agenda. And that bothers me. I hope it bothers you too. I think a good portion of the problem is that as Catholics these days, we tend to blend in more than stand out. You know, we're just like everybody else. We look like everyone else. We talk like everyone else. We live like everyone else. What is it in our lives that is going to get people to turn and take notice and to follow us? And realize, I'm not talking about being different for different sake. I'm not talking about being spectacles. That's not what I mean. What I'm talking about is living saintly lives of virtue and holiness that can't help but be noticed. And some of you right now are like, did he just say saintly again? I'm crying out loud, man, I got a hard enough time being good, much less like one of those saints, one of those books you were talking about. And if that's what you're thinking, welcome to my world. Just remember, guys, the saints were real people, right? They lived in the same world we do. They just weren't of it. How many of you are old enough to remember a man for all seasons? Not quite as many as Andy Griffith. I saw it on VHR, on a, like a cassette, right, which dates me, as it were. One of my kids, an older sister of Jack's, picked up a video cassette off the couch, and she looked like it, like it was an ancient artifact. She's like, Dad, what's the hus? I'm like, <laughs> stinking VHS, go to your room, girl. <laughs> a Man for All Seasons is about St. Thomas More, 16th century Englishman who lost his head because he wouldn't side with the king when the king wanted to divorce his wife. Pope said, no. King said, I'm going to do it anyway. Now, perhaps you think that's kind of hardcore. Guy lost his head. And it is hardcore. But if you took St. Thomas More and you put him in like a police lineup with a bunch of other guys in fuzzy robes and funny hats, you wouldn't pick him out as the super holy guy. It's not like he had a halo over the top of his head. In fact, he was a lot of, like a lot of other guys you probably know. This guy was well-educated. He was happily married with kids. He had a great job. He was Lord High Chancellor of England. That looks pretty good on a resume, right? Now, Moore looked like everybody else, but he was, in fact, quite different than everybody else because he lived his life according to a higher and holier standard in every aspect. St. Thomas More was an attorney. Let me say that again. St. Thomas More was a lawyer. If he can make it, anybody can, right? <laughs> no offense to all my lawyer buddies out there, right? You know why he was such a saintly attorney? He tried to get his clients to settle out of court because it would be cheaper for them. Now, I've had attorneys. Not one of them wanted less money, right? None of, none of us want less money, right? But we can learn from St. Thomas More. He was firmly rooted in this world. 
He raised his children, he worked his job, he engaged culture. In short, he lived out his vocation the best way that he knew how. But realize, he wasn't a mystic. He didn't have any extraordinary spiritual gifts to speak of. But just by living for Jesus Christ, his life became this neon sign that just blinked the Lord. And the world couldn't help but notice him. I mean, they made a movie about him for crying out loud. See, holiness is the bonfire that draws people in from the dark night of sin. Our lives are supposed to radiate the warmth and the grace of the love of Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of our faith. Holiness is how we get ourselves and other people to heaven. And you do want to get other people to heaven, yes? All right, imagine this is Family Feud. The old one with Richard Dawson, not the new one, right? The question on the board is what's the best thing that you can possibly do as a Catholic man to help your family and friends get to heaven? What's the best thing you can give them? You're like, I don't know, big house? Remember those exes? Oh, no. Well, how about a college education for all my kids, right? Time's up, right? You got one more strike and you're out. Suddenly, someone yells out, heaven! You're like, ding, 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 da 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 The confetti comes down. Richard's kissing everybody, right? And it was all like, kind of creepy. But the, it's so obvious, right? Heaven. Heaven's the goal. But if you really step back and thought about this, guys, every single thing in our life is ordered to something. There is a particular place that we are going. And everything in our lives needs to be ordered to that. And, and the incredible thing is, is that we have the power to make it happen. We have the ability through the grace of God. We've been given so much as Catholics. We have incredible graces at our disposal, real power to get ourselves and other people to heaven. The question is, are you ready? Are you prepared to follow the lives, the examples of those saints who have gone before us? Are you ready to leave it all out on the field, as my football coach used to say? Yeah, I played football. I know some of you are like, what? What position did that guy play, right? Last night at dinner, Elvis was telling us some stories, and he started talking about Joe Montana. And he's like, you know, Joe Montana wasn't a very big guy at all. And he's like, well, kind of like you, Matt. I'm like, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> Jerk, right? <laughs> I think Elvis has left the building. <laughs> but my football coach says, you know, leave it all on the field. And it's a legit question, right? Are you ready to do that so that you can move through this world and become a saint? It sounds like a cliche, right? But that's the goal. And this is something I have dedicated now my life toward. Guys, sainthood is what it's all about. And it's not a random or a haphazard road. For those of you guys who are back in the back and you, you grabbed a little bookmark with those cards, you'll see something on there called Next Level Catholic Academy. The first course in it is called the science of sainthood and discovering that there's an actual path laid out for us to go through, that it actually is a science to it. And it's not something random or haphazard has transformed my life and that I can't wait to share all of that with other people. There is a way to do it. If you don't take that route, take another route. Get materials. It's not like we're at a dearth of materials to grow in our faith and understand what it takes to become holy. We got material coming out of, our, out of our ears these days. There are no excuses. So for the rest of our short time together, I want to point out three things that will help you become a holy Catholic man. You practice these things, and not only will you make it to heaven, but your life now will be transformed, 100% guaranteed. Number one, learn how to love. Like, oh, man, he's starting with the mushy stuff. There is an element to mushiness with love, isn't there? You should have seen me the first time I met my wife. I was like silly putty in her hands. But truth be told, true love is nitty gritty. Don't believe me? Look at that. That is an icon of self-gift. That's what the bishop was talking about in the homily today. It's an icon of gift. Death to self. 
That's true love. True love is when you walk through the door after a long day at work and you go and you take the baby from your wife's hands because she's about to lose it because the baby's been crying all day. All you want to do is sit down and have a bourbon, right? But you take the baby instead. That's self-gift. Death to self means that you and I have a responsibility as Catholic men to put our wives and our kids ahead of us. Our wives should be on pedestals, guys. Our kids' desires and needs should be in front of ours. Other people's needs should be in front of ours as well. And yes, you are called to be the head of the family. Don't shirk that role. You better be the head of the family. And a man naturally falls into leadership positions in many areas of life, and this is something that is God-given. But as most of us figured out a long time ago, we are not intrinsically superior to women, are we? No. You're all supposed to say no. I tried, honey. I'm sorry. <laughs> are they different than us? Of course they are. Don't listen to what the garbage of the world tells us that there's nothing different between men and women. I'm so sick of the propaganda they are shoving down our throat on a daily basis. Be sensitized to that. <laughs> Modern culture will do everything they can to belittle men. Don't let them belittle you. We have a role in this God-given economy. We are imaging the Father to our families, and we are different than the ladies who don't look like us, they don't talk like us, and thanks be to God, they don't smell like us either, right? So we're different. But men and women were made to give of themselves one to the other. So power and pride can never be the force behind our leadership in our family lives. And to be honest, look, a lot of us need to be reminded of this. I know I do as well. We can't dominate those around us. And a man who loves never lords his position over somebody else. And Jesus is the person who teaches us this. Because if there's anybody who could have dominated by sheer power, it's Jesus. He was God for crying out loud. This is why Jesus was Jewish and not Italian. All right? Can you imagine? Yeah, trust me. I know people, right? <laughs> You know why there's sometimes tension between men and women? It's because we don't love correctly. True love is sacrificial. True love serves. John of the Cross says that love actually creates equality. Pay attention to this. Love creates equality because it seeks to serve the other person. Right? And this isn't just true in marriage. It's true in all of our relationships. And it's a truism because it comes from Almighty God. You ever step back and wonder how is it that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all equally God? It's three persons, one God. How are they co-equal? It's because of love. It's because each one of them looks to give themselves to the other. And so one is not better than the other. Love creates equality. Put the other person first. That's how the Trinity lives. That's how you and I are supposed to live as well in our families. And we love God through how it is we love other people, starting with our family. St. Paul says in Ephesians that men are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved his bride, the church. What did Jesus Christ do for his bride? It's right there. He offered himself death to self for the sake of the other. That's true love. We need to learn how to love and serve and sacrifice like Jesus Christ. That's true sainthood. Number two. This is a no-brainer. We celebrated Mass here today. And in every church that you guys are a member of, there's a gold box. Some of them are prettier than others. And inside of that box is the God of the universe. And every day at altars all over the world, a priest shows up and he makes God available to us. I want you to think about that for a second. The God who holds your very being in existence makes himself available to you on a daily basis. The God who sacrificed himself makes himself available to you. I don't want a show of hands. How many of you make yourself available to him? If you are not getting to Mass and you have the opportunity to do so, you are out of your mind. That is where the power to live and love like Jesus Christ comes from. And look, I know everybody's busy, right? Work is long and demanding and we got to take care of our wives and our kids and we have car repairs and we have home repairs. You got to watch Monday Night Football, right? 
Life is demanding. On the other hand, raise your hand if you've ever been head over heels in love. And I don't mean with a car or a gun. I mean like with a woman, right? Raise your hand. Remember back in those days when you were like super head over heels and maybe you're, you're still in that state, which would be awesome. But you would, you would do anything, right? When you were in love with somebody, you want to be with them every moment of every day. When I first met my wife, I lived in Chicago and she was in Steubenville. I would finish a 60-hour work week. I fight rush hour traffic in Chicago. I drive eight hours on the most boring road in all of America, I-80, just to get to Steubenville for a day and a half to stare into her chocolatey eyes. Then I'd pull myself back, right? And two weeks later, I would do the same thing. And I, you guys have probably done the same thing in the early days of your relationships. Remember when you would gladly stay up and watch romantic comedies with her? Some of you even watch like Anne of Green Gables and stuff, you know? And you're like, I know I'm gonna probably have to answer my buddy's questions at work tomorrow. Like, what did you do last night? Well, I watched Anne of Green Gables, you know? But you did it, you were in love. And so you were willing to make sacrifices for the relationship, right? That's the kind of relationship that Jesus Christ wants with us. He wants us to be a, he wants to be a priority in our life. In fact, he wants to be the priority in our lives. And when I think it's too difficult, for me to get me and my family to mass, whether it's late in the afternoon when I know my kids are going to be totally antsy, or it's a 7 a.m. mass in the morning because that's the only one I can get my kids to, and I'm like, oh, I have to do this again. It's hard to get up or it's hard to go late in the day. You know what I do? I think about or I look at a crucifix. Jesus was beaten to a bloody pulp and nailed to a cross for you and me. What are we willing to do for him. And I'm not saying this to, you know, make you feel bad. But that's the sacrifice he made for us. And it really is not about guilt. I'm tired of hearing about Catholic guilt. I got news for you. There's Protestant guilt too, right? The whole human family is guilt. It's not about guilt. It's about love. How much do you love Almighty God? Without the grace that Jesus Christ offers us in the sacraments, there's no way that you are going to be the Catholic man that God made you to be. It's just not possible. This world is going to hell in a handbasket and it's trying to take you and your loved ones down with it. I don't know if you noticed. And yeah, I know, I know. Jesus has a plan for your life. So does the devil. And he wants to kill you. And he wants to kill your family too. Don't ever forget that. Get the confession. If you didn't do it today and you know you need it, get the confession today. And then you get to the sacraments as often as you possibly can. Make it primary. Build your daily schedule around it. The Eucharist is the medicine of immortality. It is the source and the summit of the Catholic life. It's everything. This is where we encounter Almighty God. Your Father in Heaven wants to give you everything He's got. And realize what that is, guys. 2 Peter 1.4 says we become partakers of the divine nature of God. Your goal is to be deified, divinized. St. Athanasius said God became man so that man might become God. You are never going to get a better offer than that. Here's how it works. Just to give you the really quick theological thing to put some meat on the bones for you guys. The whole point of Jesus Christ coming down and doing that he became man. He became like us. So that through the sacraments, we are joined to this sacred humanity. So he took humanity and he joined it to his divinity and he became man. Through the sacraments, we pass through his sacred humanity and on into his divinity to become like him. That's what it's all about. That's why the sacraments are so important. You're joined to him already. If you're not partaking of the Eucharist, what's wrong with you? It's the most powerful thing in the world. Get to Mass, right? St. Clement of Alexandria said that something is perfect when it lacks nothing. Well, guess what the sacraments fill us up with? God. That's our path to perfection. So at the end of the day, our, everything in our lives should be ordered to preparing ourselves for that communion, that meeting we have with the God of the universe, our next encounter with Almighty God. And one of the most effective and most powerful ways to prepare ourselves to receive the sacraments is through number three, and that's prayer. This one might be the hardest of all three. 
Why? Well, because it involves slowing down and shutting up. Christ wants us to conform ourselves to him. Right? He wants to be in relationship with us. Prayer is that relationship. You know, when you think about it, not having a prayer life is ludicrous. Because if you're not praying, you're not talking to the person who loves you more than anybody else in this world. Prayer is so important that the catechism says it's not enough to have the will to pray. You have to learn how to pray. There is an art to praying that is essential to the art of living as a Catholic. And I assure you that somebody who has made prayer a part of their lives prays a whole lot differently than the guy who's like, oh, God, help me when he sees the blue lights of Michigan's finest in the rearview mirror. I swear I'll never do it again, right? And then, what, two weeks later, you're doing it again. A lot of us look at prayer as something that is just kind of this boring thing that we have to do. You know why we're supposed to pray? Because we are made to pray. You are made to pray. Think about it. If our end goal is divine union with God in heaven, an ecstatic relationship that is beyond anything we can compare, then prayer and moving into that relationship is what we should be doing right now, right? It helps us attain that end goal. But that relationship, again, is not something that happens later. It happens now. You were made to pray. That's why the more you do it, the easier it becomes. You ever notice that? And just like human attention or human relationships, you've got to give God your attention. Your human relationships need time to grow, right? Your wife always wants quality time, right? So does God. Just you and him. And some of you are like, well, Matt, I learned how to pray the rosary when I was little. I say litanies, I say a memorare before every Spartan game because, you know, they need it, right? <laughs> but if you're praying, that's great, right? You've got to keep it up. But just make sure that those memorares and those litanies and those rosaries are not mechanical. They have to come from the heart. Jesus said, don't babble like the pagans. But whether or not you're reciting a prayer you've known all your life or you're making one up on the fly because you know you're a convert, then realize that it's basically a conversation between you and Almighty God. This is where we tell them what's going on in our lives. This is where we tell them, you know, these are my needs, Lord Jesus. Please help me. And just like any important relationship, you've got to spend time alone with him. But prayer isn't just talking to God, it's also listening to God. This is an art we've lost in modern society. Okay? We have to meditate. And if you don't know how to meditate, you had better learn. There are three different kinds of prayer in Catholic tradition. Vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. Okay? You've got to learn them and practice them. That's what's in prayer works in the back. And I don't write books to get rich, trust me. Writing a book is the closest thing I've ever done to giving birth. I don't like doing it. But I know that developing a real life of prayer transformed my life. And it will transform yours too. You've got to engage in it, guys. So if you're not doing it already, what I want to encourage you to do is set aside 15 minutes. Okay? 15 minutes. You spend more time looking for something to watch on television. You set 15 minutes aside, and I will tell you right now, you're going to be distracted out of your mind in the beginning, but that's okay. St. Teresa of Avila says when distractions come, just offer them right back up to the Father, and they become a prayer in and of themselves. Okay, so the devil can't win for losing. But if you're already spending 15 minutes, good, then it's time to take it to the next level because this is no time to be mediocre. But I challenge you, spend time with God, and don't wait. Don't put it off. St. Alfonso Ligori said that short of a miracle, a man who does not practice mental prayer, Catholic meditation, will end up in mortal sin. Mortal sin is death, guys. You don't want that. In another place, he paraphrases St. Teresa of Avila, and he says, if you're not entering into Catholic meditation, you don't need demons to carry you to hell. You carry yourself there in your own hands. Don't wait. This is not something to put off. We spend so much time working out and trying to maintain our physical bodies. How much time are you spending to maintain your spiritual body, which at the end of the day is the only one that really matters, okay? And if you really start to pray and you get to the sacraments often, your life is going to start to change because this is where you get the power to live like Jesus Christ and to love like Jesus Christ and be with Jesus Christ forever. And St. Paul says anything less than that is scuba love. You know what scubala is? It's a four-letter word in English that starts with an S. St. Paul said that? Yeah. 
St. Paul said that. He said, it's rubbish. Scubula. Yeah, the things of this world are great, guys. It's good. But they're mere shadows of what it is that God has prepared for those who love him. So you got a nice house? Wonderful. It's wood, bricks, and tile. Scubula. Your sweet car. It's a piece of metal that gets you from point A to B at the end of the day. Scubula. Your 50-inch Vizio. Scubula. Live in this world, right? Enjoy it. Don't let it consume you. Don't let it be your end because it's all going to pass away. Keep your eyes on the prize, and that is heaven above. Jesus Christ came and suffered and gave himself up for you so that you and I might have an opportunity to live in eternity with him forever. That truth should be the catalyst for how it is you live your life. That truth should dictate our decisions on a daily basis. And this conference is here to stoke the fire. But this is not enough. It's a great start. It's a great pick-me-up, a shot in the arm. But you have got to make a decision that you are going to be the holy man that God made you to be. How? It all starts with the sacraments and prayer. You get to them early and often. Just like voting in Chicago, right? <laughs> but time is short. Right, because you don't want to get to the end of your life whenever that might be, and you don't know when it's going to come. But you don't want to get to the end of your life and realize that you didn't love Jesus and others as much as they deserve. That you didn't get to the mass as often as you possibly could. That you didn't pray enough. That you didn't do every single thing in your power to get yourselves and your loved ones to heaven above. Because this is it. There are no second chances. Life holds only one tragedy. Ultimately, not to have been a saint. Jesus is waiting for you to give it all to him so that he can give it all back to you, which at the end of the day is all there is. And so I ask you, are you ready? That wasn't good enough. Are you ready? Yes. Live a life of no regrets. Don't let this world distract you. There's nothing in this passing world that's worth a detour. You don't take the long road. You take the short route. You get right to God because he offers you everything. He offers you his very divinity. It's the offer of a lifetime, literally. So let's you and I be saints together. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, thank you so much for my brothers here. Empower us to live saintly lives so that we can set the world on fire. We pray for all of our family members, all of our friends, even our enemies, that they might see your light and love in us. May this world be transformed starting with ourselves. In your precious and holy name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gentlemen.